Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Susan Shore, and I'm the head of the Digital Inclusion Division within the ITU's Telecommunication Development Bureau. Uh, Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, members of the panel and the audience, uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this WTDC side event on digital skills for youth employment in the digital economy. In our session today, mm -hmm. we're going to explore the latest trends in digital skills for youth employment in the digital economy. We will hear from different stakeholders, their experiences in providing digital skills, training for employment to young people, and we'll hear more about the recently launched ITU ILO digital skills campaign as part of the global initiative on decent jobs for youth and how inter interested stakeholders can contribute to that campaign. Our session today offers an opportunity to share experiences and best practices on providing digital skills training for youth employment to young men and women around the world. We'll analyze challenges and opportunities into, in order to ensure that future generations are equipped with the skills needed to succeed in the digital economy. To get started, I'd like to turn the floor over to the BDT Deputy Director, Mr. Yushi Torigoi, to share his welcoming remarks. Mr. Torigoi, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Susan. Uh, excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, on behalf of our director, BDT, Mr. Sanu, I'm very pleased to address uh, at this uh, uh, WTDC event on digital skills for youth employment in digital economy. Our aim for the session is to share the best practices on digital skills for youth employment and issue a call for action to join the Digital Skill for Decent Job for Youth campaign to train 5 million young people globally with job-ready digital skills by 2030. Uh, this uh, Digital Skills for Decent Job for young, uh, Youth campaign was launched with uh, I, uh, ITU and ILO, International Labor Organization, in June. In fact, uh, I was uh, the speaker at this uh, um, ILO ITU event that was uh, held in conjunction with the uh, RISIS forum. And uh, we, have, we are enjoying a quite good relation with uh, uh, other UN agencies uh, in view of uh, ICT as a catalytic law for economic and the social development. And ILO is a new organization with a partnership. We have been uh, doing a quite good uh, collaboration with the uh, organization, including UNESCO for education and uh, uh, eHealth, a uh, World Health Organization. And we are very much expecting this uh, new collaboration with the, uh, ILO. Um, the campaign is part of the ILO's uh, global initiative on decent job for youth, a multi-stakeholder partnership for the promotion of youth employment worldwide, through which uh, 22 United Nations entities are joining hands in support of realization of 2030 uh, development agenda. The goal of our campaign is to connect young women and men with the job opportunities offered by the digital economy, offer special training programs for young women and young entrepreneurs and train teachers so that educational programs better prepare young people for the digital economy. To succeed, we will strengthen collaboration between ICT, labor, and education ministers and work closely with national governments, private sector, training providers, academia, NGOs, as well as other members of UN family. Digital skills are key to address global youth employment crisis. The digital economy is creating job opportunities and salary advances for those with digital skills. Indeed, estimates show there will be at least 10 million unfilled jobs globally for people with advanced digital skills between now and 2030. So if you have a skills, uh, high qualified uh, skills on ICT. You have a lot of opportunity. This because current not enough young people are being trained with advanced digital skills, leaving employers unable to find enough staff. Uh, the reward for those who master digital skills is growing number of career opportunities and higher pay. Moreover, 
training youth will benefit everybody because when youth have decent jobs, we will we'll all prosper. We all have stake in preparing young people for a bright future. That's why ITU is delighted to see today's panel composed of our stakeholders uh, that are already taking concrete steps to train young men and women uh, with digital skills in line with ITU ILO uh, Digital Skills Campaign. We are also very pleased to welcome ILO, our partner, this campaign. Uh, we look forward to hearing your ideas on how we can contribute to the global campaign on digital skills for digital decent jobs for youth and how we can incentivize more stakeholders to take action. I firmly believe that together with uh, uh, we will succeed to connect young people with unprecedented job opportunities in digital economy and thereby contribute to the implementation of sustainable development goals. Please join us. Thank you, Susan. Thank you very much, Mr. Torigoi. And then now I'd like to present our distinguished panelists who are going to share their experiences in digital skills training for youth employment. To my left is Mr. Daniel Spoyala, national expert for the European Commission. To my right, Dr. Shah Jahan Mahmood, the chairman of the Bangladesh Telecommunications Regulatory Commission. Then we have Mr. Christoph Ernst, senior employment specialist at ILO. And um, next to Mr. Ernst, Ms. Fiorella Haim, who is the general manager of Plan Sibal in Uruguay. So let me give the floor to our first panelist, Mr. <coughs> Daniel Spoyola from, from the European Commission. Um, Mr. Spoyala, the European Commission is very active in ensuring young people in Europe are equipped with the necessary digital skills. For example, the EC developed a Digital Skills and Jobs Coalition, which aims to train one million young unemployed people for vacant digital jobs through internships and traineeships, apprenticeships, and short-term training programs by 2020. Could you tell us more about your activities in this area? Thank sure. you. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the, the panel. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I will uh, tell you, I'll give you information, I'll tell you a little bit about the Digital Jobs and Skills Coalition. Actually, my specialty, I, I coordinate the European Union uh, policy on digital for development, so later I will be speaking about what, how do you think about digital skills when, when, when it looks at the policy of, the, of development, because at the end of the day we are at the development conference. So when, two years ago, the European Commission put on the table the digital single market strategy. Uh, it's uh, a policy doc that is one of the ten priorities of the President Juncker of the European Commission, and it looks into how we can really take the benefits of the digital economy in Europe, have one single set of rules across all 28 member states. And digital skills were among the issues that we are, were looking at, because then and even now we are faced, of course, uh, with the youth unemployment in, uh, in Europe. And when my colleagues that are in charge of this job, uh, uh, Digital Skills and Job Coalition, looked at the data, we realized that uh, among the population, 43% of Europeans do not have basic digital skills. Then when we look at the labor force, uh, so this was this approach as citizens and then labor force, and looking at the labor force, we realized that 37% of the people that are employed uh, or self-employed in the European Union does not have, do not have digital skills. This is all coming in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a digital, let's say, new revolution, because this is a new industrial revolution that is disrupting traditional businesses where digital skills are becoming uh, crucial. Uh, we cannot speak about economies of the future <laughs> without having uh, digital skills on the table, actually. Um, so, uh, then, when we looked at the educational system, we, we realized that 20-25% of uh, teachers in the European Union are not teaching using digital tools, or they are not trained to use those tools. However, when we look at the European Union, uh, for those of you who understand a little bit how the European Union looks, you'll realize that uh, the European Union as an institution does not have legislative powers of the member states on the educational field. The educational field is a, a right that is sovereign to the ma each member state in, in, in part. However, we want to take steps at European level so we can 
have the opportunities, uh, take the opportunities uh, of this. And of course, we are looking at how the, 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 the uh, for example, the digital ecosystem has evolved in Europe because over the, over the last three years, Europe has grown a lot in terms of digital innovation, in terms of startups. We have 1.5 million people working on digital economy right now in Europe. However, by 2020, we realized that we have a shortfall of people of high coding skills of 750,000. Uh, while our youth is still, we have youth unemployment issues. So, uh, my colleagues, I realized that the best way to do this is a, in a multi-stakeholder way. Because this, the digital skills are not something that is only of the interest of the governments. It's of the interest of the, of the private sector as well. It's the interest of the NGOs as well. So how we can round up all these multi all these, uh, these, these players in a multi-stakeholder, uh, let's say, platform where uh, everybody pledges to do something and we have some targets. So the targets, as you mentioned, the big target is uh, by 2020, we'll train a million youth uh, in this. Then uh, we were looking towards the educational systems and we have, uh, let's say, have an agreement with the member states that the member states would develop digital skills strategies uh, on each of the 28 member states. Meaning this would be focusing on how the education, how uh, the, uh, let's say, the, uh, the, the digital coding and basic digital skills are mainstream across the educational systems. Uh, then, so we, we develop, let's say, uh, a common concept, so everybody can work from the com common concept. We are putting together examples of best practices in all 28 member states because a lot of things have been done, so we have to learn from, from each other. Uh, and it's a, you know, it's a concept of more stakeholders are gathering in this. This, this initiative is uh, gathering momentum. Unfortunately, I cannot give you data right now. I don't have the data to tell you how, ma how many people, how many youth have been trained on digital skills. But of course, at the other side, the European Union has what we call the Code Week. This is, uh, we are teaching, we have one week event once a year where tens, hundreds of thousands of youth are trained uh, on, on, digital, on coding. And this creates, I think this is one of the most famous, let's say, uh, initiative of the European Commission. We just had an event last, yesterday when I was leaving Brussels. Uh, it was a, an event, in, in, a big event in Brussels where we have uh, uh, startups, uh, co coders that all join forces and voluntarily uh, coming and, and teaching kids how to code. And of course, this is somehow, there is an initiative that is called Code Week Africa. I don't know if this is the moment to talk about the external policy later, no? So this is, I will end my intervention right now, and uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much. And, um, and for the, the sake of the audience, I believe that many of these materials that you talked about are freely available oh online on the uh, European Commission's digital skills website. So I believe you have a database of best practices uh, and the guidelines that you were talking about, about setting up national policies. So that could be a useful tool for, for many of you um, in the room. Now let's pivot to the um, Asia-Pacific region. Um, we know there are a number of countries that are very active in ensuring that the population is equipped with digital skills that's necessary for today's digitized world, and this includes Bangladesh. So we would very much like to, to hear from you. We understand Bangladesh is very active in providing young men and women with job-ready digital and entrepreneurship skills to ensure they're fully equipped to succeed in the digital economy. Could you tell us more uh, about these activities, please? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Moderator, and good morning to you all. Uh, thank you that you said it is very active, and if I give you some statistics, <clears throat> then you'll realize that you have rightly chosen the word very active. Yeah. As you know, Bangladesh is a country of 160, more than 160 million people, and it is the most densely populated country in the world. Most densely means, you know, population per square mile or per square kilometer. It's the highest, highest in the world. At some point in time, this population was considered to be a liability, but now we consider this thing as a strength of our economy. Thank God that we have that many population. Yeah.
Speaking of youth, you know, the definition of youth varies from country to country and also from agency to agency. United Nations define youth uh, as a person between 15 to 24. Commonwealth countries, Commonwealth, they define the youth as 15 to 29 year old. And in our country, we define a youth to be a person between 18 to 35 years old. And that consists of one third of the total population are youth by the definition. So that means nearly 55 million youth we have. So that tells you how big the problem is for us. To tackle this problem, the youth, in a systematic way, we had a youth policy that was implemented in 2003. So obviously that's not backdated. So new youth policy has been in place that considers the digital skills or digitalization has been taken into consideration in the new youth policy. In this new youth policy, ICT education has been mandated, has been made mandatory in all schools, primary and secondary schools. Using, and we generally produce about 350,000 IT graduates from almost 118 universities in the country. The unemployment, as far as the unemployment rate goes, is somewhere in between. We rank 133rd in 2016. The average unemployment rate in the world is 18.68%, and Bangladesh has an unemployment rate of 10.39%. The highest unemployment rate, if I may mention not to attack any or not to criticize any country, just for the sake of the statistics, in Bosnia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, that's 67.61%, and lowest in Cambodia, about 0.44%. Speaking of that, that's so much of the statistics. So, <clears throat> our, in our country, under the effective leadership of the ICT advisor to the Honorable Prime Minister, who happens to be the son of our Honorable Prime Minister, our digitalization program is going at a full speed, in full throttle. And then the, mis, the main motivation of, of this ICT education is the something called Vision 2021. When this government came into power in 20, uh, 2008, they took up a program called Vision 2021 that demands, and that was in the, in the election manifesto, that says that digitalization has to be completed by 2021. And in, by 2021, using this digitalization and other technology, Bangladesh has to be catapulted into a strong medium income country. So that is the, that is the whole purpose of creating all the education policy. Uh, that, and also the education policy also was in confirmation with the SDG number eight, which says decent work for all. So with two vision, with these two visions, uh, with, with, with two purpose in our, I mean with the two uh, goal in our mind, the vision 2021 SDG eight. So the education policy was formulated for the year. So, and to, so first we look into the market analysis. We try to analyze which way the market is heading to. Because this digital market is very, very fast changing. Today, whatever is there today, tomorrow it may not be there. So we carefully monitor the market and we develop the market-driven policy. So our market, 
where is our market for the digital youth? This is mostly it is outsourcing. The two no outsourcing, and uh, we we have become the top 25 global service outsourcing market in the world. And then there are freelancing. About 60,000 to 80,000 youth have registered with the government who, does the, who do the freelancing. And we are expecting that this, because of outsourcing and freelancing, our revenue will be about $5 billion by 2025. So depending on the market and on the um, basic I mean, uh, background on, on which we have developed the education policy, we have divided the education into two types. One is the long term, another is short term. Long term means, you know, that in schools where you can impose or where you can teach the students ICT. So that's a long term because that's a systematic process, systematic way of training the kids in the schools. And another is short term. For the schools education, what we believe that not ICT education, rather ICT in education. That means ICT is an, we consider ICT as an enabler for a good education or marketable education these days. And so based on these models, we have developed learner-centric participatory environment for the education. And we have found that multimedia is a very effective way of teaching younger generation ICT technologies. So far, we have installed about 23,000 multimedia classes in uh, secondary schools and about 15,000 in primary schools. And we have so far trained 180,000 teachers uh, for teaching in this environment. 27,000 education institutions are under monitoring. You know, we also have installed dashboard, the central places, so that we can monitor what is happening in the ICT classes. So about, uh, we have installed about 27,000 dashboards. Yeah. So this much is for the long-term education in institutions. For the short term, we are expecting, uh, we, we, we try to train some people, some ICT, you know, um, uh, personnel in two, three to four months. Some of the projects are something called earning and learning, that we will train them in three months to get into the market, but not a formally educated you know, guy. But in three months, they can hands-on experience. They can work on the market. So they, will, they mostly work as a freelancer. And so far, we have trained about 55,000 workers in, under this category. So another project is called skill development for mobile games and application program. As you know, this, this is the age of mobile apps. So this is a very, very big market. Any app you develop, it solves immediately. So we train these guys, not in the schools or colleges, but in three to four months, how to develop various kinds of apps. So far, we have developed about uh, about 1,000 apps that is available in the Google uh, Play Store. And then another project in this area is called She Power Project for Sustainable Development for Women through ICT. So the purpose of this project is to reach the rural areas, the distant, far distant areas, to train particularly the women uh, in the ICT area. So this is the, my first round contribution uh, in this area. So hopefully I'll be talking for the second time another way. So my last point is 
that we talk too much on educating the or developing skills in the youth, but we don't talk much on the developing the market for them. So I think, you know, along with this education or along with this skills development technique, we should also emphasize on developing the markets where the youths will be employed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Mahmoud. Again, it's uh, very impressive what you've uh, accomplished. And one of the numbers that uh, stood out for me was training 180,000 teachers. And indeed, it seems that we might continue to have this digital skills shortfall in, until such time as we change the education system. Um, so I know that Plan Cibal in Uruguay is working uh, in this direction. I know you've been a leader uh, in terms of the One Laptop Per Child uh, initiative many years ago. And I know that you're now active in researching the most effective ways to use ICTs in education and in particular about introducing computational thinking in the national policy. So could I ask you, Ms. Haim, to share uh, what you're doing in Uruguay right now in that regard? Sure, thank you. Good afternoon. Well, we are only three million in Uruguay, <laughs> so <laughs> it's kind of hard uh, talking after you, you know, because my numbers are <laughs> will look very small. So I will, t I, I will talk in percentages, okay? <laughs> So Plan Ceibal started in 2007 and it's a, as an equity plan uh, delivering laptops to every child uh, in public schools and giving them access to internet uh, wireless connectivity. So 85% of children in Uruguay go to public school, so almost all of, of children from ages 6 to 15 have their own device, laptop or tablet now, and uh, internet connectivity at their schools are in several places. Uh, in this way, in three years, by 2009, 2010, we closed the, the access uh, digital divide. And since then, we were working, well, we continue deploying devices and internet connectivity, but on top of that, we are providing contents and tools such as, for example, our math adaptive platform uh, that has over 100,000 exercises. We have uh, an English teaching system through video conference that reaches 80,000 children every week, and they are learning English. Uh, we are covering it's like 90% of children from fourth to sixth grade that are learning English in this way, using technology. Uh, we also have all the textbooks and leisure books available in a digital library. We have um, different apps uh, for uh, science, for language, for, for, for different subjects available for children. And well, we also are working in a um, global network called NPDL, uh, New Pedagogies for Deep Learning, led by Michael Fulan in Canada. And we are trying to develop other skills in students, uh, such as collaboration, communication skills, uh, critical thinking, creativity. And we are trying to do that through technology, using technology as a, as a way to promote all these things through multidisciplinary projects and project-based learning. Um, the challenge we are facing now is inclusion of uh, computational thinking in the curriculum. We are working in, in three different educational levels. We are work working at primary schools. We started um, a pilot uh, in September. We're working with 40 schools where they are full-time schools. You know, you have eight hours of schools in these schools. And children are having classes of computational thinking through video conference. And what's computational thinking for us 
Well, it's a way to solve complex problems. It's not necessarily related to computer problems or not necessarily coding um, would be the, the solution. It's very related because it's the way computer scientists think. But it's the way to, to solve these complex problems by uh, taking them into smaller parts, trying to find patterns, trying to develop abstraction, and trying to, to design algorithms to solve them. Most of them obviously end up being a, a coding project, but not, not necessarily. We are working with children from 10 to 12 years old, and teachers are very motivated because they are relating all the curricular content they have to, to see in the year with these problems. So it's, I think it's the same thing uh, they are trying to do in Bangladesh, that ICT is not a, an issue in itself, but a way to, to have better results in all the other subjects. Then in high schools, what we are doing in middle schools, from ages from 12 to 15, we are trying to, to transform the computer labs into digital labs, or, and some of them into maker spaces, inspiring the Fab Learn uh, labs in Stanford with 3D printers, robotic kits, um, audiovisual kits, sensors. So in this way, we, we can promote also collaboration, teamwork, trying to solve these problems and problems related with, with the interests of students. So they are more engaged and they don't uh, drop off uh, school, which is a huge problem in Uruguay. The, the third line we are working on, maybe I will talk a little bit later, but it's related to young people from 17 to 26 years old that finished the, the ninth grade. And uh, we, we have a nine-month program to teach them how to go code. This is a program that's coordinated with uh, the IT companies. We work together with them. Teachers are, in fact, workers at IT companies. They are programmers that are teaching through video conference. And after the nine-month program, these young people go to the IT companies to have a, um, an internship. So, well, that's about what we are doing. Thank you very much. It's, it's very impressive, uh, as always, to hear from uh, Plan Sibal and what you're doing. Um, now, as the BDT Deputy Director uh, mentioned at the beginning of our ses session, ITU and ILO have recently launched the Digital Skills um, for Decent Jobs for Youth campaign aimed at training 5 million young people with job-ready digital skills. And so we're really happy that we have uh, our ILO representative, um, Mr. Ernst, with us. Could you tell us uh, more about this initiative and how interested stakeholders could contribute? Thank you. Um, first of all, about the Globe Initiative on Decent Jobs for Youth, right? Okay. Um, the youth is facing a lot of challenges on the labor market. Now we go back to big figures including Uruguay and Bangladesh. <laughs> uh, so we have 71 million young people who are worldwide uh, unemployed. We have more than 150 million youth work, who work but live in poverty. So you have a lot of young people also in, in formal employment. And especially young women worldwide face higher unemployment rates than younger men. They are more in not indecent types of jobs. So there are a lot of uh, challenges we face. That's why uh, the, the Global Initiative on Decent Jobs for Youth was launched by the Director General of the ILO in 2016 as the overarching global initiative to scale up action and impact on youth employment in support of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. 
Our vision is a world in which young men, women and men have greater access to decent jobs everywhere. We don't want to create a lost generation. The youth is also the future. A bit of history and who are the partners in this global initiative. The global initiative is the first ever comprehensive uh, United Nations system-wide effort for the promotion of youth employment worldwide. Under ILO lead, 22 UN entities, also ITU, have committed to strengthening youth employment action at country and at regional levels. They are calling for other strategic stakeholders to join and have already elicited political interest and support from governments, social partners, the private sector, youth and civil society organizations, the media, regional multilateral organizations, foundations, parla parliamentarians, and the academia. What are the strategic elements of this initiative? There are four interconnected pillars. Alliance, action, knowledge, and resources. The global initiative is based on an alliance of committed partners taking action across eight thematic priorities sharing the knowledge and leveraging resources in order to scale up action, normally they are not smaller scale, but to blow them up, maximize the impact and create real changes for young people. So one of the eight thematic priority areas are digital skills for youth, therefore the, the campaign I will explain in later on. But there are others you may be interested, for example, quality apprenticeship, it's also linked, Green jobs for youth, youth in the rural economy, and all these kind of technology, digital skills also help for that, if you talk about the sensors, big data, etc. Transition, transition to the formal economy, youth entrepreneurship and self-employment, youth in fragile situations, also fragile states, uh, the youth from 15 to 17, here in Argentina we call this protected youth, in hazardous occupations as well. I will stop here for this question and uh, let's move on. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, we have such a short amount of time for this session and it's, it is a bit frustrating because I'd very much like to bring the audience in but I know the panel has a, a very rich experience. Um, but I'd like to go to, to the audience if I could uh, now. We're also really fortunate to have with us today uh, Mr. Tanme Bakshi, um, who's going to be one of the keynote speakers at the ministerial roundtable right after this session. Um, and uh, he's a 13-year-old uh, digital genius, if you don't mind me uh, calling him that. You might want to stand up so people can see you. Um, <laughs> So, so Tanme, um, in view of the current youth unemployment crisis, why do you think, and you can sit down to make your remarks if you want because you'll be closer to the microphone that way, why do you think it's important for governments to support digital skills development? Oh, thank you. Perfect. Uh, so I think this is important because if you think about it right now, first of all, of course, we've got this youth employment crisis. Uh, but if you think about it, on the on one hand, uh, we've got another crisis, which is that in general, we've got this huge skills shortage uh, for people working in the technology industry, people, you know, programming in general. Uh, and I believe that uh, governments can really, uh, I guess you could say, kill two birds with one stone with this one and not just solve uh, that uh, technology crisis. There are not enough people working working with technology, but also take a look at this youth employment crisis uh, and solve that as well. Because really the government now would say, you know, we've got all these resources, can't we channel this into the youth and say, uh, all right, we're introducing them in schools to, you know, math, science, language. Uh, can we not also introduce them to these digital skills, provide them the digital skills, provide them this knowledge about all this sort of technology, uh, and then from there not only get them ready uh, for their future and give them employment, uh, but at the same time uh, allow the technology in 
industry to have so much more uh, manpower and really uh, nullify that shortage as well uh, and provide more people there as well. Because again, in the future, uh, with all these new technologies that are coming out, like AI, uh, our need for technology is going to grow exponentially. Uh, and even right now, if we've got this shortage, you can only expect that to get much bigger. Uh, and so we can, again, really uh, solve that youth employment crisis because every job in the future will be linked in at least some way uh, to digital skills. And again, that's the proof here is, I mean, I mean, as you mentioned, in Uruguay and in Bangladesh, we're starting to uh, implement computational thinking in schools uh, and bring computational thinking uh, to the youth. Uh, and so, yeah, I, I think it's very important for the government to take these resources, channel it into the youth, implement uh, digital skills, uh, digital skills development into these curricula uh, and allow the youth to learn from it. Uh, and in fact, I even actually have a goal uh, to reach out to at least 100,000 aspiring beginners uh, along their, you know, first steps of learning to program. Uh, and I'm already around 5,000 people there. And I do this uh, through tons of different media, uh, like, I mean, of course, my YouTube channel, books and blogs and, uh, and keynotes, etc. cetera. Uh, but again, it's really important that if we want to make the bigger change, uh, entire countries will, will have to start implementing this. Uh, and I believe we are, you know, taking our first steps there. Uh, and in the future, this has to keep growing. Uh, so we're able to meet this demand. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, you spoke so well on other things, but uh, what about yourself? What area you are genius or digital genius? Why you are called digital genius? <laughs> sure, thanks. I mean, uh, really, apart from just programming, I really love artificial intelligence, uh, and I love developing with deep learning algorithms, uh, especially seeing how, like, for example, artificial intelligence and neural networks can be applied in fields like healthcare. Uh, in fact, an, uh, one project of mine is actually called The Cognitive Story, and with it, we're trying to give artificial communication ability uh, to quadriplegic girl that actually cannot communicate naturally uh, and my role in the project is actually using deep learning algorithms to understand her EEG brain waves uh, and to convert those to natural language. Uh, so it's really interesting. I love working with deep learning uh, and not just again in fields like healthcare where I believe it's making the most impact but also entertainment, education, uh, business and generally uh, you know actually talking about also the next level uh, of the uh, digital economy itself. Uh, apart from that though I will be talking a lot more about that at my, uh, at my keynote uh, at my keynote in a few hours as well uh, during the ministerial uh, roundtable. So when you say artificial neural network, etc.? Yes, mainly neural networks, uh, the architectures behind them and how they can be used uh, with all sorts of data, uh, no matter, you know, no matter, no matter how it's collected, working towards sort of challenges with AI, like privacy and misuse. Uh, and in general, I think it's really, really interesting how AI is impacting so many fields around the world. Will you come to Bangladesh for work? I'd absolutely love to. <laughs> 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 These are exactly the kinds of uh, exchanges that we, we hoped to, uh, to spark in this session today. Um, is there anybody else in the, in the audience that would uh, like to ask a question here in the front row, please? Um, hello, uh, my name is Hind. I'm from Sudatel, from Sudan. Um, I would like to, to comment on uh, Mr. Mahmoud's uh, final uh, words where he spoke about creating the market for the digital skills. And I believe that if digital skills are not combined with entrepreneurship skills, those skills won't be employed. Uh, because rather than creating the markets, why not teaching those youth how to understand the market to create their own, their own employment and their own jobs? Um, coming from a country where even if digital skills are, are educated, the markets are not ready yet. So. The focus and the and the solutions, I believe, in startups and in entrepreneurship. And I liked when Mr. Ernest said that it's one of their initiatives, the entrepreneurship skills. So I believe that if those two are not combined together, digital skills and entrepreneurship skills, the decent job creation won't, won't be complemented. So that's that's a comment. Okay, thank you. Now. Um, I also I understand that Mr. Mahmoud needs may need to leave for another uh, obligation, and I also understand that Tan May may need to leave. So I hope everyone will uh, excuse, excuse us if we if some we lose some of our uh, panelists. But I also understand that Ben uh, Petrozini had a question. So please, the floor is yours. Thank you, Susan. Uh, my name is Ben Petrosini. I work for IDRC the International Development Research Center of Canada. C 
Canada is um, engaged in this issue of uh, decent jobs and uh, youth and skills. Uh, we are approaching the issue from uh, a perspective of digitization and the future of work. We're trying to understand how digitization is affecting the creation and the attrition of jobs. And uh, there is a comment and a question here. And it's the fact that um, the digital technologies will be dramatically changing the labor landscape. And although it's very important to train youth uh, to get decent jobs, there is, uh, for the jobs that will be created, which are largely, as Mr. Mahmoud commented, uh, largely uh, outsourcing jobs. We're working in Haiti, for example, to get jobs for girls that can work in uh, foreign French markets, so that uh, offers a number of opportunities. But it also offers a huge number of risks and changes in labor laws and conditions for local markets that have to do with health, protection, number of hours of employment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're, we're working in the creation of a global network of researchers. We're actually collaborating with the research department at, at the ILO. Um, the question is, how much work are countries doing in parallel to training these youth to, so that they, they have decent <laughs> conditions of work? Because we run the risk of uh, a race to the bottom uh, competing for very low rates on digital online service jobs and so on. So there's a huge area there that of of uncertainty and black box, and well, Canada is uh, engaged in this issue, uh, and we would like to exchange views and collaborate with uh, any country that might be working on these matters. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Um, anybody on the panel like to respond to that, uh, Christoph? So I, I completely agree, and, and ILO is, is already working on that. I think we, you shouldn't forget the opportunities due to, to the digital economy, but there are also risks, for example, to this, this uh, platform economy and uh, as a researcher, maybe in India you can get hired in, in South Africa, but if they don't pay you, who is defending your, your, uh, your, uh, your rights? So we are working on that. I just met a colleague just uh, an hour ago from Geneva who is working on that at the global level, and uh, we are uh, starting to work here also on, on the national level. But we have to get our experience. It's, it's very new, and we also have to understand what are the gaps, what are the needs of the people, and how to join. It's, it's a question, we be talking about the future of work. It's also a future of the institutions, the regulatory framework, but also trade unions have to define themselves differently and, and workers, employers' organizations as well. So this is, I think, a very important area that this is just, not just an opportunity for jobs, but also for decent jobs and for better jobs. So we shouldn't forget that just to run, oh, there are new jobs, yeah, but we have to ensure that these are also good jobs. So it's, it's, it's a very important point we shouldn't forget. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph, and um, we are rapidly running out of time, unfortunately. Um, Christoph, I just wanted to give you the floor one more chance if you wanted to, to talk more about the digital skills campaign, because here again, this is an area where our research is showing that there are actually 10 million jobs uh, that will go unfilled. So it's true we have to be concerned about decent jobs, but we also... Um, have an opportunity to, to fill that gap and help young people find decent jobs uh, that, that actually exist. So I'll give you the floor again. Thank you very much for giving me the floor. But I think it's good to explain it a little bit because uh, uh, many of you can also join this, this campaign. Let me explain a little bit. The campaign uh, in mid-June, ITU and uh, ILO launched the Dig Digital Skills for Decent Jobs for Youth campaign, which is part of this uh, youth initiative uh, I explained before, to advance work under the thematic priority of digital skills. We talked about the eight areas, and one is on the digital skills. The goal of the campaign is to prepare young women and men for the job opportunities offered by the digital economy by delivering job-ready, transferable digital skills to 5 million young people around the world by 2030. 
And if you look at the skills mismatch which already exists, for example, there's a lack of ICT talent, at least 10 million ICT jobs may remain vacant between now and 2030. As our young gentleman also mentioned, you know that there is a need, so it's, it's not irrealistic also, that, that goal of 5 million young people. Encouraging the creation of new job opportunities in order to integrate more young men and women in the labor market and promoting an enabling, an enabling environment where youth can seize the self-employment and entrepreneurship opportunities, as mentioned, offered by the current digital economy. And also, I think what is important, as Sasha Ann also mentioned, it's not just entrepreneurship, it's also creating the market for that. You know? you, we also have to ensure that there's not just the supply side is working, but also the market. But we have seen there is already a gap and a need for, for these people. A number of organizations, public and private, have already made commitments to the digital skills under the global initiative. Um, further commitments uh, are encouraged and may include, for example, organizing digital skills development programs for youth, e.g., for example, coding booth camps or mobile apps uh, development trainings. We have seen that there are already initiatives, running special basic or advanced digital skills development programs for young women specifically, training young entrepreneurs on the use of ICT to grow their businesses and, and learn the businesses, including digital skills in apprenticeship and uh, education professional development programs across sectors, revise the school curricula and providing financial support to existing digital skills development programs and the creation of new ones. So we invite here also all the organizations to join this campaign. Uh, regional, national stakeholders who share our vision and uh, we are creating an alliance of multiple partners, each contributing differently towards the same goal. Partners could bring in their expertise and knowledge, like IDIC, take an example, or utilize their convening power to advocate, forge synergies, and expand action. Sometimes we also need this kind of political power to support it. Or put resources on the table, financial or non-financial human resources or uh, other type of resources. To become a partner, organizations submit commitments that connect to the global initiatives, strategic elements, and thematic priorities while demonstrating how they will advance the sustainable development goals. All commitments are registered in our engagement platform, which will be launched end of October, so in, in upcoming days, you can see this on, on, on the website. And available on uh, the website, uh, you can see uh, on the top, it's uh, decentjobsforuse.org. Uh, so here you have the contact information. You can also get in touch with me. So we are trying also to, to expand, to have more impact that other organizations can all contribute to this new campaign. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, again, I'm aware we're running out of time. Um, I know there's one more question from the front row, and then I'm going to give our other two panelists uh, an opportunity to provide any uh, closing remarks that they would like to provide. So please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity, and I'm sorry for delaying people. My name is Tariq Hamza. I'm the president and CEO of uh, an operator, the mobile operator in Africa. Uh, our HQ in Sudan, and work in West Africa and Dubai, in Middle East. Um, so I have two questions for Mr. Daniel, I think the European uh, Commission. Uh, what are the clear strategies for such kind of transformation? Uh, you guys are now... Uh, you did talk about uh, a lot of initiatives uh, at the, the European Union, uh, but I would like to know the exact strategy that you guys are going to follow to, uh, to to complete that kind of transformation, uh, which is worried me. Uh, there's a lot of risk related to that kind of transformation, but the one of the biggest risks uh, risk, uh, is the cyber attack, which the more digital world, more digital jobs. I don't know about sorry about security. Uh, what kind of precautions or what kind of strategy that you guys are following uh, 
Because the more people you train, the more jobs you create for digital arena, don't forget that every 40 seconds there is a cyber attack, put companies down, put uh, schools down, put universities down. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I will take this opportunity to have my last intervention as well because it's somehow connected. You know, I, I, I'm participating in ITU meetings for a while now. Actually, ITU was my first job when I was working in the Romanian government uh, before moving to the European Commission. So I know that this is a debate that is going on for a long time. So I, I will try to make the parallel about what you are do we are doing in the European Union. And, you know, what is that actually is the same issue that we are seeing all over the world is that we have to start talking more to our colleagues because digital skills is not, for example, uh, a responsibility that is of, of my own department, is the employment colleagues. So what we did, we went in and, and cooperated with our colleagues that are doing employment and we are moving with them a lot. So you know, we are at the DSM level, we are investing money in accelerators, in a, in, in a lot of coding initiatives. So we have a number of projects that, you know, this is the transformation that we are doing. It's a large number of projects, of training projects, investing in innovation centers, investing in coding, giving opportunity, increasing the, well, say, the amount of venture capital available on the European uh, market so the, the startups have money to succeed. But when we speak outside and we are looking at, at everything, so it's like, You'll hear my boss uh, in a few hours, in two hours, actually speaking more about this. But we realize that we are investing, only the European Union is investing 32 billion euros in developing countries every five years. Together with the member states, we have 82 billion euros on development. This is 52% of the global money available for development. Yeah? But when we looked at on what, which, you know, which is the direction of those monies, like you see that the EU is investing traditionally in roads hospitals, food, uh, security, and the traditional one, the basic needs. And we said, and when we look at this, like, okay, how much do we invest in digitalization in developing countries? In the last 10 years, 500 million euros. That is not so much compared to, well, it's a, it's a big sum as well, but it's not so much the capacity of the European Union. But digital is cross-cutting, so how we can get involved more? So we went to speak uh, with our uh, agriculture colleagues and presented them what digitalization can do for agriculture. You know what, it worked. Because they realize, even if they, they have a smartphone and a laptop, they don't know how, what satellite can do for, for agriculture, increasing four times the production. Uh, we went to speak with our education and employment people, and they realized how much digital can do for education. Then, so in May, the European Union launched its first strategy on it's called Digital for Development, and it's focused on four main priorities. So we are engaging on affordable broadband connectivity, because we can, we can speak for ages about the impact of digitalization. Without connectivity, nothing is there. Uh, our second priority is digital skills, and we see how we can mainstream digitalization in what we are already doing. We have Erasmus Plus, a lot that we are doing a lot with Erasmus Plus around the world. We have a number of projects helping developing countries to modernize their educational systems, how we can embed digitalization in that. Third one is uh, digital entrepreneurship, and this is connected to digital skills. How we can support accelerators and incubators, and this is very much uh, your intervention, because we are looking at, and it's our, let's say, objective to, to create these spaces where people can go and learn and they have access to finance, as well have access to venture capital. And the last one is that how we can mainstream digitalization as an enabler. So here we are looking at boosting e-government a lot, e-agriculture, e-education, e-health, uh, besides the research projects. So we have a number of research projects that we are financing in developing countries, but we want to go there and really help countries deploy this type of systems. Now, we'll have the EU, Afri our focus right now, will, the first time will be Africa. So we have the EU Africa Business Forum, uh, digitalization will be on the agenda, uh, the, uh, EU, sorry, the EU Africa Summit. Then on the 27th, we are organizing an Abidjani EU Africa Business Forum that will be on digitalization. We are financing hundreds, let's say maximum of 100 startups, half, half European and African to come there and show to the political factor that this, the digitalization is creating an impact, so we are trying to, to, to create awareness, so we are putting our resources in this. 
uh, we'll have a round table of, on, digital, on digital economy. Is it time for Africa to discuss about the digital single market? Uh, this is important to have the same rules on the African continent. Can we connect it with the DSM? And we're going to launch what we call the external investment plan. We hope to leverage 44 billion euros in investments in Africa with this. Uh, so we're going to guarantee investments uh, across, across the African continent. So we have very concrete uh, things to put on the table uh, on this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel. And I'm going to give the last word to, to Fiorella Haim. Uh, and then I think we have to, to wrap things up. Okay, I will go very fast, just uh, saying that we are contributing with 5,000 programmers to your campaign. Uh, in three years, we started this year with 1,000, and they are learning how to code. And we, we think uh, regarding the, the jobs and the quality of the jobs, these are young people that either they don't work or they, like, they work at a supermarket, uh, very low quality jobs, so they will go uh, up in the quality of the jobs. And we, we have a software industry in Uruguay that needs coders. Uh, and that's the way that other people that maybe are engineers that are coding can do other stuff, uh, our tasks more complex and then we can have the entrepreneurs. But it's a different uh, field, and we need them both. We need entrepreneurs, but we also need coders that they just do the, the work. And I'm, I'm an engineer, so I, I, I'm not very familiar with all the regulations, all the legal and jobs regulations, but in Uruguay we have a very strong tradition of protecting jobs, so I think we, we, we are safe there. And thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for uh, making a, um, a commitment to join uh, our digital skills campaign. And anybody else that's interested in joining the campaign, please uh, feel free to approach either Christoph or myself or, or both of us. So I just wanted to give a big round of applause to the panel. I think we had a great session, and thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the WTDC. Thank you.